Good afternoon. Welcome to the IFSI's Facebook Forum. Today we're joined by leadership from multiple fire service agencies to provide you with an update, followed by an open question and answer period. We're gonna allow everybody a few more minutes to log in and get connected, and uh, then uh, the, get the feed going, and then we'll introduce our speakers. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, just, just stand by and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Hello again, and thanks for being with us today. I'm Chief Jim Keegan. I'm the Deputy Director here at the Illinois Fire Service Institute, and, and I want to welcome everybody um, that's uh, logged into the IFSI Facebook forum. Um, the uh, Illinois Fire Service Agency status update uh, is the topic of our forum today, and uh, it's being hosted as part of the IFSI Facebook forum series. Um, today, we're joined by leadership um, from various Illinois Fire Service agencies, um, and um, they're, they're coming to us across the state um, through the virtual Zoom program um, to give you an update of what's going on in their agency um, in the fire service. Um, we want them to we want to give them a chance to communicate with you the, the general updates to, to you. And uh, right now we're going to start off by, uh, they're going to start off by letting you know, um, we're going to start off by uh, asking you to let us know where you're from. Uh, one of the keys to this program is that you participate and uh, give us uh, some questions and give us some uh, comments as we go through the rest of the day. Um, let us know where you're from, your department, and uh, or your state, and anything else that you want to share with us. Uh, once uh, our presenters get going here, um, we're going to give you an opportunity to uh, ask questions and get uh, the experts uh, from around the state to answer them. And uh, this is an open dialogue forum, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we give you uh, plenty of time to answer that, and um, we welcome our questions from our friends from outside of uh, the Illinois borders also. So um, this is our way to, to connect with you and to connect with the Illinois Fire Service. Um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to State Fire Marshal Matt Perez, Chief Perez. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to IFSI for borrowing us your technology to make this happen. This is a, it's a great thing for the fire service. I'd like to start by saying thank you uh, to all of you for everything you've done to keep Illinois safe during this COVID-19 crisis, and also for joining us today. I appreciate the fire service organizations that have come together today, because I believe this forum is important to keep you up to date and to make you aware of the cooperation that is happening between us all to support you on the front line. The model of one team, one fight is never more fitting than it is at the present moment. The OSFM has been forced to make many adjustments to our agency operations and our assistance 
to the fire service while dealing with the crisis. Our focus remains on safeguarding the health and safety of our employees and the Illinois Fire Service while trying to fulfill as many of our responsibilities as possible. We establish which functions of our agency were essential to continue and which non-essential functions we can still do safely. We also transferred 95% of our office staff to working remotely and our executive staff continues to take turns manning the office. The Arson Investigation Division has continued to provide, to provide their services without interruption. The Boiler Safety Division is conducting exterior inspections only. The Elevator Safety Division is providing accident investigations only. The Fire Prevention Division is currently limited to exterior inspections and COVID-19 emergency use facilities. The Tech Services Section is working remotely to respond to your requests. The Petroleum and Chemical Safety Division is limited to permit work inspections and investigation of accidents. We are, however, currently in the process of planning a phased recovery strategy as we be begin to bring our operations back to normal or our new normal as it will be. Fire service outreach personnel are working remotely and have canceled all speaking engagements and conferences. They participate in the State Emergency Operations Center briefings as part of the Public Safety Working Group. The 2020 Firefighter Memorial Honor, Honor Ceremony, I'm sorry, the 2020 Firefighter Medal of Honor Ceremony that was scheduled for May 12th was canceled. We will be in contact with recipients to have a member of the committee scheduled to personally present awards at their fire stations. It is our intention to honor our fallen brothers, Jake Ringering and Cody Van Fossen at a rescheduled fallen firefighter memorial ceremony in September at the state capitol grounds. We will send notices for this event when the date is secured. The ps &E staff is working remotely to respond to requests. On May 1st, ps &E resumes scheduling the regional sites for paper testing and Pearson View currently has centers that are open and operating at 50% capacity to ensure social distancing. All paper exams that were proctored in March are now graded. Please refer to your training records on the ps &E web access for posted exam results and the most current notifications. We are working on updating our rules concerning recertification. These rules will be up updated and simplified uh, based on the feedback we've received from you all throughout the last couple of years. We will also be adding recertif recertification requirements for all research or for all certs except basic operations firefighter, advanced technician firefighter, fire service executive support, youth fire setter intervention specialist, hazardous materials incident command, water operations, watercraft technician, and airport firefighter those will not have research requirements. Uh, many of these changes that we're uh, proposing, like I said, are based on feedback that, that we've gotten from you. We wanna make this easier for you to access. Uh, some of the things we're looking to do is to restart the current 2017 four-year certification period to 2021, except for fire and arson investigator, which will remain the same. Because we cannot guarantee JCAR will approve these amendments, Prior to the current research date in 2021, please continue to track your training as you currently have. We'll look to switch to the use of task books instead of tally sheets, ensure that any required training from IDOL, IOSHA, and ISO are all automatically included in your research. We'll look to, research, uh, to set required research hours at or below the original course hours over a four year period. We'll consider matching hazardous materials operations requirements to federal requirements, and also consider matching fire service vehicle operator requirements to meet IDOL ISO requirements. And lastly, if uh, recertification is not completed, the certification is not eliminated, and it will still be able to be accessed and printed from the ps &E web access. In tandem with the proposed rules, we're working towards purchasing a third-party enterprise system that will be offered free to all Illinois fire departments and will allow them to access research task books, certification records, and could be used as a fire department training records retention system. OSFM is also actively working with IFSI and IDOL to update the minimum firefighter training guide that was released in 2015. Our finance division reports that there were 540 applications for small equipment grants. Of these, 
about 160 were ineligible due to not filing or not filling the forms out properly or not being compliant with an incident, incident reporting system. About 200 grants from 380 remaining applications will be awarded in mid-June. In anticipation of budget hardships, uh, that this crisis will place on local departments, the OSFM and IFA are working on statutory changes to allow a two-year extension on existing revolving truck and ambulance loans. This will defer payments for two years and move the next loan payment back until November of 2022. The state will also face COVID-19 crisis related budget difficulties. We will continue to advocate for the best interest of the fire service and maintain as much of our submitted budget as possible. Our public information officer continues to be proactive in distributing COVID-19 related fire service and EMS guidance recommendations and pertinent information on our social media channels, the OSF web, OFM website, and email blasts to the fire service. We have stayed in close contact with all the fire service in order to keep the State Emergency Operations Center, IDPH, and the governor's office up to date on all issues you are facing. We have also been tracking the effect of the COVID-19 crisis on our firefighters and fire departments. We share this data every morning and I would request that if you have firefighters quarantined or that you have tested positive, please send me an email at matt.perez at illinois.gov so we can keep accurate data. Consider getting yourself tested. A link, a link to the current testing sites can be found at the IDPH website. There are IDPH websites, state run, uh, they're identified there. Uh, they can give first responders priority, test asymptomatic first responders, and they are free of charge. All the other sites are allowed to provide these services, but set their own requirements. So follow OSFM on Facebook, Twitter, and if your department has positive stories or you are doing things to help residents in your communities, please send those to the OSFM PIO at jc.fultz at illinois.gov so that we can share those stories with the people of Illinois. Lastly, I wanna draw your attention to the preliminary explosion, exposure reduction training that has been developed by IFSI and is located on their website. In addition to this valuable information and training on minimizing your exposure to carcinogens at fires, you can have your chief sign up for a free on-scene decontamination kit for each engine on your department, which will be distributed distributed by our friends at Mabus. Uh, I, I learned today, as of, as of this morning, there were 500 decon kits that have been reserved and we have a total of over 3,000. So I would really encourage you, number one, to get that information and training uh, and awareness from the IFSI website and number two, to please sign up and uh, get your buckets from Mabus. So with that, Jim, I appreciate the time and I'll turn it back over to you. Chief, what a great example of all the things that go on behind the scenes that uh, a lot of firefighters may not realize are occurring during this, during this time. Um, thank you very much um, for the, the update, but also thank you very much for all the work you do for the Illinois Fire Service. Um, it, it, it's clear that you and your, your team are tireless in uh, getting things done for Illinois firefighters on a, on a daily basis. Um, I'd like to uh, turn the session over to... Uh, IFSI Director Colonel Royal Mortensen right now um, to get an update from him. Thank you, Chief Keegan. Um, as uh, Jim indicated, I'm Royal Mortensen, the Director of the Illinois Fire Service Institute. IFSI is part of this webinar today because IFSI is the bylaw statutory state training organization for Illinois. Our mission, helping firefighters do their work through training, education, information, and research. In the execution of that mission, IFSI annually trains over 61,000 students, reaching nearly 1,000 of the 1,100 departments in Illinois, delivering training in all 102 counties at over 315 unique locations. The over 200 courses and classes that are offered by IFSI represent the full range of skills from basic to advanced. Additionally, over 150 other response organizations take IFSI courses such as HAZMAT and NIMS ICS. Included in these numbers are 550 classes each year delivered to over 730 departments, equaling over, equaling over 1,200 students 
as part of the Cornerstone program, which is essential skills firefighter training delivered locally across Illinois at no cost to departments or firefighters. IFSI works closely with the Office of the State Fire Marshal, State Fire Service organizations, and fire departments to ensure we are meeting the needs of Illinois firefighters. This includes delivering dozens of NFPA compliant courses that lead to Illinois state certification as well as national certification through our relationship with ProBoard and IFSAT. How has the COVID-19 response impacted IFSI and our ability to do our mission? In support of the Illinois Governor's Executive Order, IFSI stopped the delivery of all face-to-face -face training on 14 March. It became undeniable to me and other fire service leaders that the cumulative effect of stopping the daily and weekly training of over a thousand of, of thousands of firefighters across Illinois would eventually have a direct effect on public safety. That reality led IFSI to quickly do three things during the COVID-19 shutdown. One, maintain all functionality needed to ramp up training delivery quickly once COVID-19 restrictions began to ease. Two, quickly develop alternative online virtual training content that would help fill the void until face-to-face -face training could resume. And three, develop CDC and IDPH compliant COVID-19 risk mitigation policies and procedures for all IFSI personnel and students to be implemented once training resumed. What steps has IFSI taken during this COVID-19 response? With regards to the three areas I've already mentioned, maintain functionality to resume operations, quickly develop online and virtual training, and develop CDC compliant risk mitigation procedures, we established minimal manning across the Institute by remote working and teleconferencing, but we also ensured to do all the ascent that all essential functions would continue to operate at a reduced level, including operations, logistics, curriculum and testing, business and finance, facilities and support, library and research, technology-based training, as well as IT, continued to maintain a warm capability in anticipation of restarting. Within 10 days of stopping face-to-face -face training, IFSI began the Facebook forum and soon thereafter, virtual cornerstone training. These deliveries are live, interactive, and relevant, and they are no cost to students. To date, we have delivered 12 live training broadcasts in the Facebook forum, reaching thousands of firefighters with over 140,000 views. This engagement has seen students from not just Illinois, but 12 other states, in six different countries. The virtual cornerstone training deliveries, three of which have happened to date, have seen similar results in terms of student engagement with 700 plus students per delivery encompassing 25 different states. Additionally, IFSI continued deliveries of online content and moved classes that had not been online to an online learning format. With regard to developing risk mitigation procedures, for the resumption of training. On 14 March, IFSI established a standing working group internally to address COVID-19 issues. We have put together detailed risk mitigation procedures for the execution of face-to-face -face training that are CDC compliant for all IFSI staff, instructors, and students. We have already implemented many of these procedures and promulgated the details to our staff and instructors. All procedures will be in place when we resume full operations. Finally, our governor has declared firefighting training and consequently Illinois Fire Service Institute as an essential service and function. As such, we have established a crawl, walk, run plan for resumption of training deliveries that will have the appropriate risk mitigation procedures for all staff and students. On May 18th, the resumption of our Spring Academy will take place. They've completed all their classroom material in online format over the last eight weeks. The only thing remaining is the hands-on aspects. During June, a short list of selective deliveries across all programs have been approved by me. And on 1 July, we anticipate the Cornerstone program to resume in full statewide as well as other programmatic training. Our goal was to be ready to gradually resume training deliveries when the Illinois Fire Service was ready to train. 
not the opposite. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel. Um, again, uh, a lot of a lot of things going on here at IFSI, as always. Um, another great example of uh, training uh, never stops for the fire service, and uh, with the support of a number of uh, partners and agencies, IFSI has been able to uh, continue its mission of helping firefighters. Uh, I'd like to bring up uh, mutual aid box alarm system, Mavis, uh, Illinois, pres our ex chief executive officer. Glenn Erickson. Glenn. with providing some type of support in the pandemic response, as well as members of the Task Force One Urban Search and Rescue Team and the Cook County Swiftwater Rescue Team. These taskings have included setting up rapid mobility shelters and generator light towers at hospitals, COVID-19 testing sites and correctional facilities to facilitate patient triaging, testing and treatment. Mavis operations staff have maintained a continual watch at the state and Cook County Emergency Operations Centers. And they perform an important role in maintaining the information flow to and from the fire service. And they do this while trying to maintain their support responsibilities to their assigned divisions. It's a big task and uh, uh, they're doing a marvelous job. Other Mavis assets tasked in the pandemic response include the mission support vehicles assigned to the EOCs and the testing sites, and unfortunately, the mobile morgue vehicle that's in use in the Cook County area. Mavis mission support personnel have also been assigned to alternative housing, fatality management, public testing site, and communications planning. Mavis has also maintained regular communications with Mavis, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota to exchange information and best practices. We are still responding to new taskings each week while demobilizing shelters that are no longer needed. Regular communications with Mavis Divisional Dispatch Centers or PSAPs continue to monitor the impact the pandemic may have on the ability to provide normal or mutual aid responses. At the Mavis headquarters here in Wheeling, we're no different than any other business trying to maintain normal operations under pandemic restrictions. Much of the Mavis staff is working remotely and, and staffing here at the MRC is, is limited. All, most or all training and exercises have been postponed to a later date. Most activities at the MRC have been postponed. However, we're still conducting essential operations and are in place to coordinate any other emergency that should arise other than the pandemic. We're also supporting an Illinois National Guard COVID-19 testing site operations center here at the MRC, which should be standing down this week. Where the limited staffing is really impacting us is the distribution of the uh, 3,000 firefighter gross decon kits that the uh, fire marshal uh, mentioned. Uh, all that material is here at the MRC. Um, we're trying to throw the buckets together and we did have our first uh, mass deployment this morning and it went very well. And uh, we're gonna be working very hard to try and get information out to everybody so uh, We'll get the statewide distribution up and running when it's safe to do so. While we're still in the middle of the current pandemic response, we're already looking at some immediate and future needs such as restoring the deployed Mavis assets to full readiness, uh, seeking out grant and other funding opportunities to increase our preparedness for future pandemics, uh, restock our depleted stock of 
personal protective equipment that were housed in our warehouse trailers. Uh, this equipment was deployed early in the response and uh, you already noticed that we we'll have to replace and repair a lot of worn out equipment. We're also looking in the possibility and, and finding a way to warehouse additional PPE that will be dedicated to the fire service. And uh, that will be a goal of Mavis moving forward. We're also looking to start support of certification training and exercise reimbursements and, and those things like that. Uh, Again, those are some of the highlights of, of what the, the impact is of the COVID response on Mavis. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Jim? Glenn, once again, um, the, the unique aspect of uh, the, the Mavis resources being deployed across the state, um, you, you see, if you look around, if you watch news, you see them almost every single day. It's, a, it's an amazing thing, and I, I've been in contact with uh, some of my peers from across the country, and they want to know how do we, how to, how to do it like we do, because it, it, it is just a, a stellar example of uh, the, the value and the partnership of the mutual aid box alarm system. Uh, again, compliments to you and your team. Um, working short staff, nobody would ever know. Um, Thank you. Next, Next up, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Great Lakes International Fire Chiefs President, uh, Mike Maver George. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Maver George, President of the International Association of Fire Chiefs Great Lakes Division and Fire Chief of Oaklawn, Illinois, where I am privileged to lead and serve with a great group of firefighters and paramedics on the southwest border of Chicago. A division of the International Association of Fire Chiefs the Great Lakes Division encompasses the great states of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Since 1873, it has been the IFC's mission to provide leadership to current and future career and volunteer fire, rescue, and EMS leaders throughout the international community through vision, information, education, services, and representation to enhance their professionalism and capabilities. Headquartered in Chantilly, Virginia, the IAFC represents the leadership of 1.2 million firefighters and approximately 30,000 fire departments in the United States with members in Canada and countries all over the world. IAFC President Champaign, Illinois Fire Chief Gary Ludwig is on this forum and available to answer questions also. His leadership of the IAFC has been crucial during this crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected fire and EMS organizations across the nation and the globe. Firefighters and paramedics have been infected with COVID-19 and 50 fire and EMS personnel have made the ultimate sacrifice to date. Departments across our division and nation have struggled to locate and maintain stocks of medical PPE. Now, fire and EMS personnel across our division and nation face furloughs and layoffs due to the financial devastation being wreaked on our communities. And paid on call and volunteer organizations have seen their donations reduced drastically. Some are struggling to provide basic services. President Ludwig and the board of directors have continually advocated our needs loudly to Congress this information to fire service organizations of the individual states for dissemination to their members. Since the beginning of this national crisis, the IAFC has been at the forefront by gathering data, assembling subject matter experts, and providing multiple educational mediums and resources to the fire service nationwide. Hopefully, you've received this information on how to access IAFC resources. Very early on, President Ludwig impaneled the IAFC Coronavirus Task Force. He activated 
the IFC Financial Task Force to research the financial impact of this crisis on our fire service now and in the future. These task forces have already developed some great information and products. The resources developed by the IAFC can be used by the entire fire service. To access the IAFC coronavirus resources, go to IAFC.org and select Access Coronavirus Resources. The financial impact of the fire service has been and will be devastating. A national financial impact survey connected by the IAFC revealed Fire departments of all types here in the United States are estimated to suffer a $16.9 billion shortfall in budget revenue in FY 2021. Fire departments in the United States serving urban areas reported budget losses of up to $180 million in FY 2020 and a projected loss of $240 million in FY 2021. On average, fire departments serving urban areas expect an $8 million loss in budget revenue. Volunteer fire departments across the nation are estimating a budget shortfall of $1 billion for FY 2021. Career and combination fire departments have already reported 935 personnel laid off since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Believe me, a lot more will come. Fire departments in the United States are estimated to lose 29,925 career personnel in the next 12 months. The estimated cost to save these jobs is $2.3 billion per year, or $6.9 billion over three years. Our leadership can talk until we are blue in the face, but it is local action that truly makes a difference. We need you to contact your congressional representatives and senators in Washington, D.C. and tell them we need federal help now. Ask them to support an additional $5 billion for the Assistance to Firefighters Grant Program and $5 billion for the Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response Grant Program. Our fire departments and communities need federal help now more than ever. The recently filed HEROES Act contains $1 billion for AFG and SAFER. As you can see, this is not enough. This is the most trying time in the history of our fire service. And the International Association of Fire Chiefs will continue to lead, educate, and serve in any capacity we can to help us all get through this together. Thank you for your service, and may you and your families remain safe. Thank you, Chief Keeper. Thank you, Chief Manver George. Uh, again, uh, if you haven't participated in any of the uh, webinars presented by the International Association, of, International Association of Fire Chiefs each week, there's great information. Um, they have medical experts and subject matter experts every week uh, available to the fire service. They've done a done a terrific job of uh, helping to educate the fire service on what's going on in the country and what's going on, uh, some of the best practices for the COVID situation. Um, right now, I'd like to turn it over to Illinois Fire Chiefs Association President Greg Earl, Chief Earl. Thank you, Jim. Uh, hello, I'm Chief Greg Earl, Centre Fire Protection District. Speaking to you today as the president of the Illinois Fire Chiefs Association, and maybe try to put a more positive spin what we all hear. Uh, we've all been impacted by COVID-19, some more than others. Uh, we've got the modified working conditions. Social distancing has become the new normal. Our association has also adjusted to the new way of operations. Uh, conference calls, go to meeting, and Zoom have all enabled us to keep doing our business as usual. But there are many things that uh, we have not been able to do. Uh, legislative face-to-face, -face, which we're very active in. Our conference or uh, symposium, which does a lot of training, brings in speakers. All these activities have gone by the wayside, and I don't know where it will go in the future as far as canceling more activity. Hopefully, we can get that better. But while we are in this downtime, per se, uh, we're taking that time to do some enhancements 
We are working with our website. We have done a big transition in it. Uh, we are sign up and do conferences and stuff online. We can be much more interactive of knowing our members. We can do more of a, uh, uh, say, library of our people so we can know what we've got for career, paid on call, part-time, volunteer. So that is one of the, the big things we're going. We're even looking into the virtual world right now as far as some of our uh, activities that we do that, uh, as far as uh, testing and so on. Our meetings and our of our board and committees have never skipped a beat due to the Zoom and the others. Our directors and area reps are still available by phone and email. Our staff and presidents communicate daily. Our association has been in constant communication with our fire service partners to receive, share, and distribute information our members may need to get through these difficult and trying times. This webinar is a perfect example of what's being done. For information on any of these subjects, and not only COVID-19, which seems to be our uh, focus anymore, just see our website, uh, IllinoisFireChiefs.com. Also, go to our Facebook. We have links on our site to all these other uh, places to get information. You know, soon we'll be starting to transition back to a more normal and less stressful operation, be it training or personal life. Let's plan and look forward to that. In closing, I want to thank all our partners and the people behind the scene that made this live feed happen. And a thanks to all of you for serving the public through these times. And as always, be well and be safe. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Chief Earl. Um, it, it, again, it's, it's another example of the challenges that are, are not only being overcome by the fire service, but the fact that um, the fire service is continuing to grow and develop and uh, becoming better and stronger um, as we face these challenges. Um, I'd like to take a moment and uh, uh, this moment and introduce uh, President Chuck Sullivan of the Association of Firefighters of Illinois. Chuck. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, again, my name is Chuck Sullivan. I'm the uh, president of the AFFI. Uh, the AFFI represents uh, over 15,000 members in 224 communities across the state. Uh, and Chiefs Earl and Maverick George really did an exceptional job of describing what our departments and their organizations are doing as far as in the, into the future uh, uh, concerning layoffs and, and furloughs, et cetera. So, I would echo uh, exactly what, what they are saying as far as contacting your uh, delegation. So, but I want to briefly describe from a labor organization uh, what our perspective uh, is and what we have been doing over the last two to two and a half months. Uh, our e-board and staff literally has been working around the clock the last two, two to three months. Uh, we created a COVID-19 committee that includes members from various regions of the state and their job is to assist our local affiliates across the state based on, on region to, to make, ensure that our members are keeping up with the, and I know everyone on this uh, Zoom meeting can, can relate, to try to keep up with the different IDPH rules and guidelines and CC guidelines, ensuring that our members know what an exposure is. Uh, we've worked closely with many organizations uh, trying to acquire PPE, uh, also located places for our members to quarantine and, and isolate. So in addition, a big part over the last two months has been uh, involving working with the governor's staff and leaders in both chambers of uh, the General Assembly to ensure that our firefighter EMTs and our firefighter paramedics are covered under what we uh, have a rebuttable presumption statute that was actually passed into law in 2007. Uh, there's been some confusion on, on the work comp situation over the last couple of weeks, and I hope to clear that up uh, through this. So we have believed from the start, uh, since COVID-19 made its appearance, that firefighters who actually tested positive were all rebuttably presumed to have 
And that's based on current language that uh, states any type of lung or respiratory disease or condition. And in fact, IDPH identifies COVID-19 as a respiratory illness. So I want to make that clear. I believe that we are covered today. Firefighter, EMTs, firefighter, paramedics, those years or more are. However, we believed that we should make it clear that COVID-19 is in fact a rebuttable presumption uh, to avoid court costs, our members having to go through the Work Comp Commission uh, and, 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 and adjudicated that way. So uh, as you've probably been the news or listened on TV, we were able to have the Work Comp Commission uh, declare an, an emergency amendment. That was in the middle of April, I believe. And not only were we included, uh, stating in fact that COVID-19 was a rebuttable presumption, they included a host of essential workers that are working across the state of Illinois. Three days after that emergency amendment was declared or, or became law, the Illinois Retail Merchants Association and the Illinois Manufacturers Association filed a lawsuit against the Work Comp Commission declaring that they overstepped their bounds. To avoid any uh, costly and really a lengthy legal battle with Work Comp and those, those two organizations, the Work Comp Commission withdrew that, uh, that statutory, that emergency amendment. So over the last two weeks, we have continued, work, and this was always our goal at the end anyway, to work with the general, both leaders in both chambers, uh, create legislation, which would, is far stronger than a Work Comp Commission anyway. Uh, the General Assembly is reconvening, uh, I believe, next week. So there is legislation being that will include firefighter EMTs, firefighter paramedics uh, in our rebuttable presumption language. And in addition, that will include those firefighters that were hired with less than five years on the job. So that's what we've been working on. One of the main focuses uh, of the AFFI thus far. I would be happy to answer any, and I'll throw it back to you, Jim, thanks. Thank you, President Sullivan. Um, again, um, great work behind the scenes, uh, day in, day out, tirelessly for the uh, firefighters that you represent. And I know that uh, this is an issue that is, is extremely troubling to uh, a number of uh, the responders that are out there. And uh, the, the presumption issue is, is clearly not just a, a local issue, uh, it's a national issue. And, and I know that the work you do is, is important to your members, but also important to the fire service. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Illinois Firefighters Association President John Swan now. Thanks, Jim. On behalf of the Illinois Firefighters Association, I want to welcome the guest, uh, all firefighters and all IFA members that's a video conference on welcome them on board. Who we are, the Illinois Firefighter Association is the largest and oldest firefighter association in the state. We were established back in 1889 with a whole list of accomplishments over these last 130 years. Well, we did not do this alone in recent years. Well, through the Illinois Fire Service Association and members that's on board here today, we have accomplished even more. Uh, over those years, we have helped create the Fire Marshal in 1909. Uh, we helped create uh, the IAFF in 1918. 1925, we're proud to help create Illinois Fire Academy, IFSI. These are just a, a few of the accomplishments that our association has done over the last 130 years and still going. I think we can best describe our association in our, in our mission statement. The Illinois Firefighter Association Incorporated is dedicated to the advancement of the fire service by providing leadership. The association will provide the community of, of Illinois through health and welfare, education, training, benefit, information networking on a local, state, and national level. Uh, and working very hard and can, will continue. Why are we presenting today? I think uh, the biggest reason is we want to make sure our membership knows that we're behind you, that we're continuing to function as one large, uh, one organization. 
our board of directors, I would, I would like to have uh, our membership know that go to IllinoisFirefighters.org. That will be our website or our Facebook account and get any other information that you may have and be happy to answer any questions you may have um, by going through any of our board of directors. Our board of directors are not doing face-to-face, -face, but we are doing remote tele uh, conferencing and telephone calls, trying to meet with our members and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the things that, that we have concern is uh, the face-to-face -face interaction that we have, not only with our members, but here today, which uh, uh, we're solving a lot of uh, at the local level that we're doing um, is the face-to-face -face and that we're, we're going to have uh, uh, rely on a lot of our training with our mission through IFSI. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, our fire academy for setting the for remote online training. Uh, it's second to none in the state and this nation. So we appreciate everything that IFS, IFSI has done since this outbreak had taken place. On level, our directors are still attending uh, the Illinois Terrorism Task Force meetings, uh, the fire advisory meetings, uh, and so on and so forth. And we're getting uh, getting all that accomplished. On the national level, we have directors on the National Volunteer Fire Council. Uh, we're meeting with them um, periodically. And also, I suggest that our members and fire service, if you don't belong to the, Illinois, uh, the National Volunteer Fire Council, that you please get on board. There's grants available for out there for firefighters. Uh, the health and welfare issue you heard earlier uh, with the fire marshal, with the risk with cancers and the fire system, firefighter association rolled out two years ago, the Go Green Clean campaign. Uh, we're promoting that uh, and we're promoting uh, the training and education that the uh, IFS is uh, pushing uh, for the uh, risk management of cancer that uh, the fire marshal has put out. So. Uh, we appreciate all the things been done. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today and thank our members. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to turn. Oh, one last thing. Our conference is coming up again October 1st. Uh, the Down Dirty program will be run from October 1st to our 4th that weekend. It's still on schedule right now. One of those we rolled out this year uh, was Firefighter of the Year. It will be put on our website so the applications will be available there. Um, I want to thank everybody that participated today and all our members. If there's any questions, um, I'd like to hear them. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Chief Swan. Uh, again, um, tireless work for firefighters since uh, 1889. Um, I know that uh, you and your, your team are working uh, continually um, in, in a number of avenues in supporting not only the fire service, but IFSI, and we appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Illinois Association of Fire Protection Districts President Mike Dillon. Mike. If I can get this on mute, okay. On behalf of the Illinois Association of uh, Fire Protection Districts, I want to take this opportunity to thank each of the fellow fire service organizations here today for the specific roles and ongoing efforts that collectively support the work, training, and essential services provided by our first responders. Working together is an important part of what we do and uh, have done for centuries. And to witness the positive outcomes for, to me, is very rewarding. Mike Dillon. with Illinois Fire and Press Organization I have been involved with for over 25 years. This role also grants me the honor and privilege to serve on the IFSI Advisory Board, the uh, Fire Marshal Office Fire Advisory Commission, and co-chair of the Illinois Fire Service Association. The Illinois Association of Fire Districts was established as a nonprofit organization in 1942 to protect the interests, rights, and privileges of fire protection districts, supporting better governance by fire protection district officials through education, resources, communication, and legislation. 
The IFAD membership consists of 630 fire protection districts across the state, which as many know, districts can be very diverse in structure. Districts uh, can be rural, suburban areas. They are both volunteer, career operations. Fire district personnel can be paid on call, part-time, full-time, combination, union, non-union, or use contractual services. Service areas can range in population size from 550 to over 200,000. Our primary goal as an organization is to provide the resources. We keep fire district and fire district trustees informed on the ever-changing Finds local government. We bring a voice to Springfield lawmakers on issues that have an impact on our members. Last, we communicate new information on happenings among the Illinois Fire Service. During this time of crisis, like each of those here today, we have put the health and safety of our members. Their well-being a priority. Since March, the coronavirus situation has forced us as an association to cancel training programs, cancel the annual legislative day, our quarterly board meeting, and most recently, our largest event, the 77th annual conference, which was planned for the 20th. Schedule for late until virus and its impact on our like in listening. We are actual challenges. Some counties have extended their property tax deadlines. The tax levy is a primary source of revenue for many fire districts and delayed tax payments can hinder their operations budget or purchasing contracts may be even interrupted. Many districts have experienced an increase in expenses to cover the costs associated with the virus, such as enhanced sanitation practices, disposable PPE, and other supplies to protect our personnel. IFPD is keeping up with the executive orders, such as temporary changes to the Open Meetings Act, FMLA, and paid sick leave rules. Our educational leadership has coordinated a live program using Zoom to discuss these changes and made it available for anyone who wishes to view it. We have a few more one hour programs being developed for our online learning library. Some are available at no cost. We are sharing information about other online training options as well. Members, training of AFPD and the IFPD programs that are available. I want to applaud the Fire Service Institute, the Illinois State Fire Marshal's Office for their ongoing efforts to provide the live discussions and training on Facebook that cover fire ground tactics and timely information on proper use of PPE and steps for enhancing the sanitation in the firehouse. We are and will continue supporting the initiatives that help firefighters obtain PPE and other necessary equipment to keep them safe. Our office staff is working remotely, 
uh, responding to voicemail, email, and urging people to subscribe to their e-blast as their primary source of timely information. IAPD is here to sewer serve your unit of local government and or organization in any way we can. We are grateful for everything the Illinois Fire Service organizations have done over the years and all it has become to the people here in Illinois and beyond. Thanks, Chief Keegan. Thank you, President Dillon. Uh, again, uh, compliments to you and your staff. Uh, not only are you, I, I, I see that you're continuing to push out your webinar series for the trustee training, but you're also uh, pushing out the, I just got the, the last edition of the fire call. And uh, I know that your staff uh, is regularly in contact with us here at the Institute. So, so I know that you're continuing to work for the Illinois Fire Service. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Illinois Professional Firefighters Association, President Greg Knoll. Greg. Thank you, Chief. Oh, I'm firefighters formed in 1959 and my pension issues and all organizations, you and Re have mentioned, we also uh, monitor our website, emails, voicemails to get back to our membership and other people to contact us for questions concerning downstate pensions. As far as seminar operations, Illinois Professional Firefighters has been doing seminars since 1974. There was major changes to the downstate fire pension statute that revised training hour requirements. We had a May 1st event scheduled that has been delayed. And after our board meeting next week, we should have a re revised date for that. The November 8th, no, uh, pardon me, November 6th seminar will still come off as scheduled. However, based on a situation with COVID-19, we may well take that electronic. We have a July 2nd seminar scheduled. Again, after the board meeting next week, look to our website. We will contact the people already registered to explain to them their options after that board meeting. IPFA board meetings are quarterly. Our May 20th meeting will occur. Our August 19th and October 21st meetings may be conducted in person. However, will be that IPFA is involved with. Number of other presenting this after it's on the committee, Institute Advisory Committee, the Fire Service Association. All those meetings are being rescheduled or converted to electronic format. The fire marshal already explained that the Medal of Honor ceremony that was scheduled for two days ago potentially will be rescheduled for the outside memorial portion to be conducted sometime in September, again, subject to how COVID-19 continues to unwind. Something not mentioned yet is the 2020 State Fair is scheduled for August 13th through 22nd. It's one of the biggest public education events in the state of Illinois. Um, the State Fair staff has been working with the Department of Public Health to conduct it as scheduled. Unfortunately, the governor made a comment in their press conference about not being sure if the look to the State Fair web phase web dates on that once made. Again, I talked about IPF if board meeting next week. On the agenda are items to address an alternate audio visual platform. The state mandates training Article 4 fire and Article 3 pension board trustees 
in a recent newsletter from the Department of Insurance, they're still going to require training. The IPFA board's going to look to providing that on an online basis, much like this afternoon's event. Keep in mind that the IPFA board considers board, staff, and any attendees, health and welfare, the primary consideration for that. Look to our newsletter and website for information on the August, October 21st board meetings. They'll either be electronic or conducted in the office. I want three organizations. First, started meeting the COVID-19. He saw the importance of keeping the fire service every day. So it's a week. The fire marshal's office cranks out data about who's been affected, who's tested negative. If you think of the tens of thousands of responses by fire and EMS personnel, and look at the data that Matt provides that we graph on the homepage of our website, Matt, thank you very much. My second thanks goes to the Fire Service Institute, Royal Mortensen and the entire staff. Royal, you didn't miss a beat. After the early March meetings, you made a turn midstream. And as you mentioned in your part of the presentation, practical still have to be worked out and hands on, but training members of the Fire Service in the state of Illinois, you're doing a fantastic job. Go to Royal's website, fsiillinois.edu. He's got great resources on COVID-19 data and training programs in webinars much like this that can educate the fire service in the state of Illinois and keep them safe. Last people to thank, the Illinois Fire Services Association. The presenters here are one of 13 groups. It's an umbrella organization and all 13 groups join together whenever possible to work towards maintaining or improving the fire service in the state. It's a great organization, thanks to the fire services. Chief Keegan, back to you. Thank you. President Noll, thank you very much. Uh, and we appreciate the information that you shared with us today and, and the compliments that you gave to, to all of us. Uh, it, it again, you, you, you hit on a really important aspect. It, it is the Illinois Fire Service working together for the citizens of Illinois that are pulling this stuff together every single day out there. And, and that in itself is also a unique aspect, uh, not just uh, in, because it's here in Illinois, but because it's, it's an example for the rest of the nation. Um, thank you very much for your, for your information. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Chicago Fire Department Commissioner uh, Richard Ford now. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chief Keegan. Um, uh, I'm Fire Commissioner with the City of Chicago. Department for members eight million people. We have just a few people here. Uh, now I was asked, why was I asked to present? Uh, well, I happened to be in often quite con close contact with most of the fire service agencies in, in Illinois. And uh, fortunately enough, uh, Fire Marshal Perez called and asked, could I put a little bit of input in to what we're doing here? And you just can't refuse uh, the fire marshal. Uh, so as we move forward, we, what, how many, how has COVID affected response uh, in the organization? Uh, much like everyone in the country, everyone in the world, COVID-19 has changed the old normal. We're in a new state of how we handle things. And basically in Chicago, uh, the traditional operations are, are, are not really changed. EMS operations absolutely are changed how we handle uh, the many cases that we run into. Our community interaction is limited, and that's by uh, making sure we have enough PPE to protect our people, and how we, we have social distancing with the public. Our firehouse access has been limited, again, due to safety concerns. And unfortunately, 
uh, Chicago has lost two firemen, uh, two firemen, two, two members of our service. So our funeral traditions have been absolutely rewritten uh, due to COVID-19 safety issues. Uh, one of the major concerns we had initially was our manpower staff and how many people we were going to end up uh, having affected by COVID-19. Uh, Chicago has 10% of the firemen in the state of Illinois, but unfortunately, we covered 80% of the positive firemen uh, that were exposed. At no point in time did we ever go above 17% of our manpower down, either for furlough or for positive uh, uh, results, uh, but that was one of our major concerns. Uh, the steps we took in order to uh, deal with our response, uh, first and foremost, in the early part of this, we put together an incident management team to help assist and break things down so that we're making decisions that are going to be, be positive and get to a, a, a result that's protected, not only of our people, but of the citizens of Chicago. We created Intel teams to sweep data from runs that were done so we can make future predictive decisions based on the data that we actually have, how many positive members that were infected, how many members were in, in isolation, how many days left of the isolation they were. Uh, and that, in fact, uh, drove decisions based upon operation and EM EMS manpower availability. Uh, we took that information that we received from CDC, information received from the Chicago Department of Public Health, and we put that right on SharePoint so that our members every day got the latest information. And as you all know, in the fire service, we change that information at least four times. But daily, uh, we sweep the, uh, the, the pages to make sure we have the, the latest information for our uh, membership. It has to be, we have to provide them with the latest information. First and foremost, we needed to educate our membership. Uh, from past events, uh, dating way back in the early 80s when we first ran into AIDS. We knew that we needed to educate our members so that they acted appropriately, being prepared for what is going on and what is to be expected in the future days and future months to come. We created a fit test task force. We had a, a definite need in order to make sure the task, the N95 masks, where all, every member was fit tested and all 4,800 members were in fact fit tested. Additionally, we had our brothers in blue who asked could we assist them because here in Chicago we have 13,000 police officers. We assisted the, uh, the police and are going to continue to assist the police with making sure that's done. Additionally, we had IDPH reach out to us and we've dealt with the, the nurses from IDPH in order to make sure they were fit tested. And, and starting all of this, we came up right quick, very quickly with the idea that we need to start dealing with and show methodologies and, and programs in order to deal with mental stress of the membership. In fact, was done uh, so that we can have people remain calm. Uh, when we started getting uh, uh, runs that were coming in, they were starting to build up, we created a COVID ambulance service. Those four ambulances who received additional training from our EMS Region 11 reduced the exposure to the main four by allowing just those ambulances to run. They covered 90% of the ambulance calls that were in fact po uh, COVID positive. And it was a phenomenal program that we, we, we con will continue to, to operate with. Uh, our task force, <coughs> our task force uh, with the PD is, is, is something we're going to continue again. Uh, after identifying that we had members who were ill and, and, and positive, we in fact uh, made the appropriate manpower and medical decisions to maintain our staffing for both uh, inbound and all emergency uh, events that were coming to place to kind of quell the, the problems with our members that are showing up with testing. We had to find locations to get our people tested quickly and get the results back so that we can make informed medical decisions to maintain the proper, proper manpower uh, to protect the public and our memberships. In the process, we were able to identify specific hotspots and send uh, the appropriate uh, PPE and this, excuse me, <laughs> the appropriate PPE and disinfected uh, equipment to that particular house. 
uh, to deal with it. We started with safety messages to our membership. And from the very beginning, if you are sick, stay home. Oftentimes, wash your hands as much as possible. Highlighting social distances again. We presented uh, with video safety messages, one of which the fire marshal was nice enough to join me. Uh, and we, it has, it, without a doubt, made a clear impact uh, to our membership, and, and we changed uh, a lot of the, uh, the inks that people were having. Uh, we, we, in fact, found a, a hotel that we could put our firefighters and policemen into that, in fact, if they were exposed, they can go home rather than taking what they thought they may, they may have been exposed. They could go to the hotel in order to stand down and take, take care of each other. We created a mobile safety task force that, that, that would the disinfect the team that goes to both spray apparatus and houses once we were identified a, a member who was positive with COVID-19. We followed up that mobile safety task force with a medical information team that went out to the house and dealt with the, the, any concerns that might have been uh, uh, exp experienced by, by the teams that were working. And that has worked out really well. We work with Local 2, again, often uh, hoping Local 2 would join with us, and they have to a point in dealing with leadership so that we have joint protection for all membership, their families, and the people that we serve. And, and looking to the future, we ordered additional P100 kits so that uh, we could rely, release the, re, the re, need to have in that five mask, and that, in, that P100 mask is covering 99.% of the respiratory problems, uh, respiratory protection that we needed. Uh, that we uh, we continue to support our fallen members, the families of our fallen members. And we it, it created the mobile integrated health team, uh, our early portion of what which eventually turned into our, uh, community paramedicine that goes out and checks on the well-being of our 300 plus members who are currently on medical roll call. And what we've been able to do of the, with the mobile health team is any person who is needed additional resources or additional medical care, they've been able to address it immediately and it's been a positive input. Uh, so with that, uh, I look forward, I thank you all for working with Illinois Fire Service Agencies. It's been a, a, a pleasure and I, I thank you. Available to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Chief Keegan. Thank you, Commissioner Ford. Uh, again, it, 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 we've, we've been here for just over an hour and we have heard from leadership from fire service agencies, not only throughout Illinois, but out, uh, throughout the country. Um, examples of people working together. Um, Commissioner Ford's uh, flag behind them, one team, one fight. Um, I've seen that, that that statement used uh, in communication throughout the fire service in Illinois. The uh, Illinois Fire Service Association is a perfect example of that, serving not only the fire service, but the citizens of Illinois. Um, as we wrap up here, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions, um, forward them to us. Um, we, will, we will get them answered. Um, uh, even uh, even after the program today, um, we I do have uh, just one or two that that I do want to throw out there. The first one is for Fire Marshal Matt Perez. Uh, one of the questions that came in was, uh, "Do you have any concern about OSFM funding for the coming year because of the unexpected cost of COVID nineteen response?" Uh, we don't honestly know what to expect at this point because we don't know what the ramifications of this crisis will be uh, as far as revenues that come in through the state uh, but to this point the administration that's in place on the governor have been super supportive of the fire service and understand the importance of getting the training education equipment and vehicles that uh, the fire service needs they understand that there's a lot of financial hardship in the fire service uh, to supply the services we do. And they've been behind us 100% to this point. So I would anticipate that they will still be 100% behind us and uh, try and minimize uh, the effect this crisis on us financially. Great answers. Um, thanks for that update. Um, uh, one other question that I wanna ask before we wrap up for the day is uh, uh, President John Swan, um, given the nature of the difference between volunteer and career fire departments. 
How has the COVID-19 uh, response impacted volunteer fire departments in a way that wasn't expected? I think the biggest uh, thing that's uh, uh, affected is training hands-on. Uh, that that's probably the biggest thing that affected us. Uh, most of the young firefighters here, you know, and I think it's across the state, uh, feel that uh, maybe they're not going to get this thing and uh, that they don't look at it as hard as some of the, the older firefighters. But uh, uh, some of these small departments, uh, uh, PPE has been a question on the availability of it. Uh, the testing, I had uh, questions coming through on uh, uh, testing. I think the marshal uh, clarified those, uh, those questions coming through. Those are the biggest things I, I've seen so far. Um, the training hands-on thing is, uh, uh, is a, a still a big issue and questionable how we're gonna resolve those. So to play off your question, uh, we had another question um, for Director Mortensen. Um, will the fall basic operations firefighter blended program still be offered? Jim, I think Royal's muted. Oh, I unmuted. I'm sorry. How about now? Is that good, Matt? Thanks for the question. Um, the Basic Operations Firefighter Program, uh, blended program for the fall, is on track. And uh, I saw the schedule today, actually. Um, obviously, it is, uh, its execution in the fall is uh, uniquely tied to Fire Marshal Perez's efforts to sustain and maintain our funding. That program uh, it is one of the most important uh, programs that we've ever had here in Illinois. Uh, the second iteration delivery this spring for this fiscal year, um, once the COVID-19 mitigations uh, or, uh, shutdown took place, went into full online mode, which they were prepared to do and just simply uh, plowed through all the online learning so that the only thing they have left to do are the practical weekends, and those will begin here uh, at, the, uh, at the end of this month, on the 30th of, uh, of May. So we'll be able to complete the spring delivery with approximately 130 uh, graduates, um, and we are on track, uh, planning for uh, the delivery of the blended program, blended basic operations firefighter program in the fall, um, should, with the, with the, obviously with the uh, funding coming through. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Chief Perez, for covering for me, and, and thank you, Colonel Mortensen. Um, one last question um, for Glenn Erickson. Um, you mentioned the uh, decon buckets and the exposure risk reduction project. Um, do you have an update on the future uh, distribution dates for the uh, exposure reduction project? Yeah, we're uh, what we're we're getting a uh, a, a weekly spreadsheet from. Uh, IFSI, um, usually on Mondays, um, we're taking a look at uh, the distribution needs from each one of our operations branch chiefs has a section of the state and they're gonna be coordinating the, uh, the distribution downstate. Uh, we will probably on Tuesday come up with a, uh, a preliminary plan and uh, you know, our goal is to get you know, the bulk of the orders out uh, sometime in June, again, depending on uh, staffing, but uh, more information come out probably uh, early next week. Thank you, Glenn. W one last question uh, for Commissioner Ford this time. Are you hearing me? Sure. Okay, I'm wasn't wasn't sure you were hearing me. Um, are you uh, a, a question came in from uh, Rosemary Avira? Um, are you working closely with Mayor Lightfoot with the phases she shared during her press conferences? Yes, the mayor and her, and her team we talk daily.
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up now. Um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Chief Perez for any closing comments. Yeah, I'd just like to thank all organizations and uh, thank you guys for taking the time to come on with us. Uh, I hope this was valuable for the, for the people that tuned in. And my last day is that you keep your eyes on the ball. Prices take the great things you've been doing prior to it. Not unlike any May Day call, other than the Rivet team, everyone else has to keep working to put the fire out. Service organizations present today as your RIT team here to keep you trained, equipped, and to all keep doing the great work that the Illinois Fire Service is known for. Thank you for joining. Thank you for this dedication and sacrifice during this pa pandemic team. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today and for the support from our viewers. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the presenters that, that truly uh, thank you for your time and uh, not only your time, but your effort for the Illinois Fire Service. Um, this session will be posted in, on IFSI's Facebook page and YouTube channel uh, in a sh short while following the feed. A shareable link will be posted in the comments section um, once it's available. Um, Couple of updates. Uh, next Facebook forum is May 20th at 1 p.m. Roof Operations with Larry McCormick and Eric Trokin. Um, and the next virtual cornerstone program will be May 26th, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on rural water supply. Um, both of those programs are going to be great. Um, don't miss them. Um, thank you for your time today and uh, have a great evening and wash your hands. Bye bye.